tonight we're going to be talking about Chestnut Ridge in Bath County. And this is kind of a special location for me because it's one of those places that really define my early collecting. And it's a fun place if you can get up the mountain, and we're going to talk a lot about that tonight, about that trek up the mountain, which is not a very long distance, but it's quite the elevation increase um, to just get up to the top of the mountain. But uh, Chestnut's a great location. Uh, it's still something that if you have permission, if you have someone who can help guide you on the trip, it can actually still be done. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about the location tonight and some different things uh, from the past. Um, this is actually a photo of the mountains in Bath County from the Department of Tourism. A very beautiful area. If you're coming from, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to mess it up here, but if you're coming from like the Lexington area and you're going through Goshen Pass, there's a very beautiful drive to kind of get over to Bath County. So, you know, you can go collect some quartz crystals, but you can also look at some pretty incredible views. So, what we're going to talk about tonight is a little bit similar to what we normally do on these location uh, reviews, which is a little bit about the information itself on the locality. I'm going to briefly highlight some geology of the Chestnut Ridge area, uh, a little bit about the mineral information. We know that it's a primary quartz crystal location, but I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the history of Chestnut Ridge, you know, how did it first, you know, how was it first discovered, different things like that. Uh, collecting at Chestnut. So some tips and some tricks from my opinion uh, when we get to the Q&A session. If you have any, you know, suggestions on how you got all your material up there, what was worth taking, what's not worth taking. This is one of those locations that you normally don't see in Virginia, but you would think of like out west where your gear matters and the weight that you have in your backpack matters because it's how many specimens do you want to bring down versus how many tools do you want to bring up, you know, so very important to talk about that. I'll have some photos and then like always we'll have a Q&A session and I was saying that we will have a surprise which I think is really awesome uh, and is a great little piece of history that I would like to share with you about Chestnut Ridge. Um, over to the left is a really nice specimen. It's one of the large ones. It's about 1.25 inches and a very clean crisp piece. This was actually taken out of the matrix. So it was actually out of a little pocket here. It was a good specimen. Um, Normally you'll find them loose and we'll talk about that, but this is a really pretty crystal and is one of my uh, best specimens from the site. So a little bit about Chestnut Ridge. Well, for one, it's located in Bath County. You can see down in the lower right corner. It's outside of the town of Millboro, uh, but it's denoted or the specific area that it's in is denoted as the Deerfield area. Um, for those that may be interested or wanting to look in and want to reach out to me afterwards, if you're a field trip chairman or different things like that, um, from Richmond, it's about two hours and 10 minutes or 136 miles. I try to do, you know, a GPS to get us the best time estimate there. If you're from the Roanoke area or Southwest Virginia, you're going to look at about one hour and 46 minutes, which is around 97 miles. And then from Nova, that's going to be your furthest distance, even if you're coming from Maryland. It's around two hours and 46 minutes, um, which is 164 miles. Um, again, you, you can get on the highway to get there, but once you start getting to Bath County, you get in those crooked roads and the bendy roads. Um, but it is, you know, again, all the way to the east of Virginia. The biggest thing when we think about Chestnut Ridge, and one of the reasons that I think it's actually survived, you know, the, the large amount of collecting in the state is because it's very difficult to get up there. And I do not recommend this at all, at all to anyone who can't make a typical hike, who has health issues, who has leg issues or different things like that, because there is such an elevation increase, which is about 11, I mean, a, a thousand foot increase within just 0.5 miles. Um, you maybe take 30 minutes to get to the top, 25 minutes, but you're going to want to take some breaks in between. But it's just starting from the time you park your car and you just go up from an incline from there. I mean, your legs do not get a break until you get to the actual location. Um, and then I want to stress, as with any place, let's be honest, you know, don't go alone. Uh, and in this case, don't go without a guided trip from someone who has the permission to be there or who has been there previously. And those are two different things because someone who's been there previously is still going to have a difficult time finding it because there's no defined trails, there's no defined markers. 
Um, a long time ago, some clubs had actually spray painted orange dots on the trees to mark on the way back down, not on the way up. Um, but that has worn over the years. Some people put some tape around it, you know, some of that tree marking tape. But again, it's a very difficult place to find. It's very localized, and we'll talk about that. Um, so just be very careful. Again, reach out to me. Reach out to, you know, some of my friends, and we can help you with this or try to get something set up. Um, but again, you want to be very careful about this location. And it's one of those places where it's bordering national forest and it's bordering someone else's property. So one misstep, you can be in someone's land and that's not going to, you know, do very well. So you want to be very careful about that. And then this is kind of the picture over here is kind of showing you the area. You have these nice ridges and little mountains and then you have these little valleys and it's a very, very pretty area in the chestnut area. So a little bit about the geology of Chestnut Ridge, and this is not getting into um, anything specific, but um, it's part of the key for sandstone, Rose Hill, and Tuscarora formations, which are Silurian in age uh, for the geology enthusiasts in the room. And the quartz crystals themselves are very, very localized. And we're assuming that this is probably some sort of fault zone. You can tell that there is this brecciation within the sandstone that has allowed for these voids and spaces for the quartz to form. And another reason that's difficult to find is that you can go 25 yards to your right, 25 yards to your left, 25 yards too far in the up the, the ridge, and you're not gonna find the spot because it's a very localized spot. Um, the, the actual deposit itself is what's known as a quartz aronite, which is greater, or not, not greater than 90% siliceous grain. So it's a very pure quartz sandstone. And a lot of what we're going to see here is that the sandstone's been cemented or has a lot of pretty uh, red, yellows, and orange coloration coming from that hematite as a secondary growth. And again, you see that in this zone itself, but when you get around the outside, that's not the same. Um, and then later hydrothermal activity has actually allowed these quartz crystals to precipitate in these voids in these little sections. And a lot of the material there has been cemented you by the quartz itself. Uh, this is one of my favorite specimens of all time that I found from there, which is a beautiful uh, double terminated uh, quartz crystal. Uh, you can see again, there's that yellow coloration there, and that's coming from the hematite. Uh, again, it's very common to find your crystals here that have orange and yellows and reds being derived from those hematite inclusions, a lot of fractures and internal things that actually make them almost aesthetic in a way, like you wouldn't want to put it in oxalic acid and to remove this for this specimen. Um, and again, your typical formation of these double terminated crystals are these quartz points are breaking off, continuing to grow, and that's getting your backside of that crystal to actually form another point. And you can see where one part's clear, and then the second part is actually milky, and that's where that point had broken off and formed at the base. So for the mineral side of things, I would say if, if you're coming here, you need to just prepare yourself, if you're not a quartz enthusiast, that you're probably not gonna find anything else. I mean, quartz is the primary mineral of significance at the locality, but you'll also see your hematite or gertite here that is also prevalent. You'll see the gertite and hematite uh, as kind of crust over top of the crystals. Some will just be kind of so overcrusted you can't even see the crystals underneath but quartz is gonna be your primary focus. For those that know the location and know some of the history about the sphalerite and things, we'll have that later on, and that'll be a whole different you know, page. Um, for the size of the crystals, they're not very large. I mean, you're looking at a normal length of around 0.5 inches, so half an inch, to an inch at best. Um, the largest records are kind of over three inches. I've seen some kind of possibility of larger specimens that have been found there, but when you're thinking to be realistic with yourself, you're not going to be finding, you know, long quartz points like in Arkansas or anything like that. These are very small, but they're good for jewelry people. They're good for people that want a little thumbnail or want something that they can put from a location in Virginia, and they're very clear. They're very pure quartz crystals. Um, the common thing that you're going to find there are going to be loose crystals, and they're going to be all in this, all in the soil within this specific zone. You're gonna find a lot of sand when you're digging in the soil, and that's just from this rubbed up quartz that's weathering away. And that's where your quartz crystals are gonna be located in this very specific zone, localized, 
and they're mostly going to be loose. Your undamaged matrix pieces are less common. But of course, most mineral collectors, we love our matrix pieces. We want to find something that is attached to the rock or is attached as a cluster, like over here to the right. So keep in mind, though, that size matters as you carry these back down. So you might find this giant plate of quartz crystals. That doesn't mean you're going to get it back down that mountain. Yes, it's only 0.5 miles, but it's very difficult to get back down. And we'll talk a little bit uh, about the leaves. <laughs> and the foliage as you make your descent is very tricky to maneuver. And there's been so many people, even myself, to be honest, who has loaded himself down up on the mountain, walking down the mountain, slips on those leaves, even when it's dry, and fall right on your back. And you don't want to break your back on a mountain, so you want to be very careful. Um, and then there's some smoky crystals here too, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we're not quite sure where the origin of that could be. You know, there's some shells in the area that maybe has some sort of carbon or something, but they're not dark smokies. They're kind of a light gray smoky. Um, we've actually uh, found phantoms. I have one crystal that's really small that has a phantom. I don't have a picture of that. I apologize. Um, but you do find some smoky crystals here, and they can kind of be almost isolated in a plate, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and then your double terminated crystals. I would say that every time we went, we find maybe five or six double terminated quartz crystals. And that's not an uncommon thing when you're thinking about the formation of the deposit and how those things form as they're breaking around in this fault, you know, this fault area. It, you know, you're breaking apart and still forming those crystals and forming double terminated points. And you can even see on this plate here how things have kind of broken and grown into one another and there's kind of terminations on both ends. Let's go back. So a little bit about the history of Chestnut Ridge. Well, from the best records that I have, um, and it makes a lot of sense, is that it was actually discovered by local hunters that were walking around the area. Remember, it joins National Forest. And they were walking the ridge lines, walking up there to do some hunting. Uh, if you ever go up there, you're going to see lots of deer. Um, and they were walking the ridge, and they ended up coming across this area. And there were some quartz crystals there. That, by word of mouth, ended up, I guess, getting into the collecting community, and it became a fee location. Uh, the earliest that I see from a, a report is by Alan Pinnock in 1907 for his Mineral Locality Index, where he states that it was a fee location. I'd assume that it went back further than that, but that's kind of where you start seeing Chestnut Ridge appearing as a fee spot. Uh, the location was actually owned by C.A. Lone, or Buzz. Uh, some people also called him Buster. And it was a favorite site for collectors for many years. Uh, and the fun part, as with most old locations, the fees would range, right? He wasn't, give me $20 every time you come here. He was more of, you know, give me something as a goodwill to let you on my property. That could have been his favorite tobacco, as some people said, a bottle of liquor, uh, a ham, or just 50 cents. And that was what was denoted in the, in the official locality index, because I'm assuming the state didn't want to say, hey, here's a fee site, just give them a bottle of liquor. Um, you know, that used to work with quarry owners back, or quarry foremans back in the days as well. And so over the years, there's been sporadic trips that have been held. You know, someone may do it once a year or something. But it's such a tedious hike, and it's quartz crystals, and there's not much variety there. There's no combo pieces. There's no large, large pieces that it's, it's stayed a pretty nice site. I mean, it's one of those places where it deters a lot of people because it's hard to find. And it deters a lot of people because it's hard to hike up there, which is a good thing in many ways. Um, and so, again, field trips, like I mentioned in the past, have actually tried to do this sometimes. But as time goes on, there's just not enough people that go up there regularly enough that it's easy to miss all of that when you go up there. Uh, over here to the right is actually on the left side is Rudy Bland from the Richmond Gym and Mineral Society. Uh, and this is actually on the right here is Buzz Loan. And so this is from a trip in 1993. Uh, you see a cat down there, but Buzz also had a dog, which is pretty prominent in the literature and people talking about the location. But this is kind of them going up and getting ready to go up the mountain. Uh, you can see Rudy has a cart there. So, hey, that's a good idea if you're wanting to go up there. Um, but this will start kind of, you know, a little bit of some of our pictures about the location. And so collecting here. Um, Again, I didn't want to make this a very long presentation because it's one of those places that you can 
kind of still go and, and meet with people and, and find ways to get there. But um, it's a very fun spot. And I would say if you can hike up the mountain successfully, you're going to have a great time. And you're going to come off that mountain with a bag full of quartz crystals. You may not want to go all the time. I doubt you will after that long hike. But you're going to feel fulfilled. And it's going to be a fun time to go up there, hike. And once you get there, it's going to be very rewarding. Um, I highly recommend uh, to bring some sort of sifter if you're wanting to dig in the soil. Because one thing about quartz crystals, especially in this type of dirt where it's not very clay dirt, right? It's kind of a loose soil is even when it seems to be dry and there's just a little bit of moisture, quartz has a tendency to have the soil attach itself to the crystal faces. As the soil dries, it will fall off. But when you're digging, so many people would try to find the quartz and they said, there's nothing here. I can't find anything. But in reality, they were throwing away quartz because the soil hadn't dried yet. So if you want to try to do a little bit, I would suggest bringing a sifter up uh, 0.25 quarter inch, you know, mesh would work and do some, do well and will suffice. Um, matrix pieces are hard to obtain uh, and they can be heavy, but if you want to sacrifice your weight for that, then, you know, I would say, I would say do it. I mean, you know, you're going to have a bag full of loose quartz crystals, which is fun, but if you want to get those matrix pieces, you, you should have enough weight to do that if you're very strategic. Um, I have a list here of some of the proper tools uh, that I think you may want to bring. That doesn't mean that you decide to bring it. That doesn't mean that you may have a better idea. These are just some of the things that I used to bring. Um, a three pound hammer, because it's not too large, but it's better than a geo pick. I don't even think of a time that I actually use a geo pick out in the field, to be honest with you. Um, again, that quarter inch screen sifter, plastic shovels and rakes, um, go by Walmart, you'll find like a 99 cent uh, Fiskar or some sort of plastic shovel, which will be sturdy enough. <laughs> I would actually go here and we would be scraping the dirt so long that our, our rakes would actually wear down to where there was no rake left. It was just nubs. Um, but plastic always because you don't want to damage crystals. I mean, I get it. It's hard to dig sometimes, but with the soil here, you're not digging in a clay, so it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, plastic baggies, you know, your preference on how you want to do that. Uh, chisels, if you do want to actually break up some matrix pieces. Uh, wrapping material is going to be important for those matrix pieces. Very difficult to find matrix pieces that are undamaged. I mean, keep in mind, you're finding these quartz crystals in a very localized zone. There has been some weathering and erosion that's occurred, which has shifted these quartz crystals down the mountain in the soil. And a lot of them have kind of broke, they've fallen apart. And when you're finding the quartz loose in the soil, they're loose because they've actually broken away from that matrix. So you'll find all these matrix pieces and very rarely will you find one that's undamaged. You may find one piece of it undamaged. You can use your hammer to break it up, get a little bit smaller, and then you'll have that. Um, in a backpack and additional cloth bags. Uh, someone mentioned they would take a five gallon bucket. I really think that sometimes that's really rough on your hands, especially when you're walking down, it, it doesn't feel that great. So I brought a backpack, I brought a kind of a satchel. I also brought um, two kind of cloth bags or tool bags where they're not hard, bo you know, plastic boxes, but they're kind of a leather or a cloth material canvas bag, I guess I should say. Um, and, that, and that worked really well. Both of those in both hands give you some counterweight uh, with a backpack and the satchel and you can carry some stuff down. Keep your tools in a separate bag, right? You don't want them to break against your crystals and, and damage anything. Uh, and then here's another quartz crystal, which is decent size from there, which again, you see that fracture and you can see the hematite within there. Uh, this is a photo from my fan, uh, friend Victor uh, in North Carolina. He's going to be here tonight, but this is a picture coming towards Chestnut Ridge from in the Goshen Pass, and it's a very pretty area. So this was kind of on a drive of a trip up there we had in 2016, so a very pretty area. I'll be honest with you, I'm not well aware or not that quite, I don't know the geology of the Goshen Pass area. Um, you know, I don't know if there's any interesting rocks or fossils or things found in the area, but um, it's a pretty place. So if you want to stop by there, have lunch, do something like that, that's a good thing to do. I like that area. Uh, this is showing a picture of us digging here. So this is kind of what you're going to encounter. Um, 
you're going to have a lot of foliage, especially for those that, you know, go in the summertime, even in the fall time, you're going to have a lot of brush, especially the leaves that have laid down over time. Um, and you're going to have lots of rubble, like the hillside is just covered in boulders, not car size boulders, but, you know, table size and smaller. And the goal here is to remove the boulders, get into the dirt, get into this kind of lighter material and sift or shovel with plastic shovels out into a sifter, these quartz crystals. Um, the good thing about gravity as they go down the hill is that when you have a boulder or you have a tree root, that will stop it. So some of the tree roots and some of those boulders will actually you know, prevent the quartz crystals from going down the hill and actually allow for you know, a nice little pocket to accumulate, I guess, on a pocket, but you know what I mean, a little area for them to accumulate uh, and find the quartz crystals. So that's a way to dig there. Um, this is kind of again showing us, you know, we got all of our matrix pieces laid out to the right over here. You know, bring lots of water, of course, bring your food up there if you're going to be there all day. Um, and this is our sifter, this is our bag of quartz crystals. Um, so you want to have all your different tools and stuff there prepared as you go up there. Uh, another thing that I didn't actually include and I completely forgot. Uh, bring a brush, like a bristle brush with a little long bristle um, that's not too hard, but soft enough, I mean, hard enough that it's not gonna just not cover the dirt. But when you find these matrix pieces, if you wanna save your weight, don't take everything, right? I mean, leave some stuff up there for others, but also check and almost grade out your matrix pieces. You wanna see with that brush, are these points actually good? Are they damaged? You know, should I take this piece back down? So that, that brush will help you get a little bit of that dirt off and let you know, is this something I want to take back down or is this something that I want to leave up there? So that's a, that's a big thing that I think I would recommend. Uh, this is actually a really cool piece. This is showing you, again, this is that sandstone. You can see the hematite there, that beautiful red and white. Uh, I've never actually, someone maybe when we get to the end here, uh, can talk about if they know anyone that's ever slabbed this or tried to do anything. I don't think it would be that great, but um, very beautiful sandstone here. I mean, quite incredible stuff with that white and red and black with the hematite. Uh, and you can see that quartz vein there as it was a crack and a fissure growing upwards. So a really cool piece here. Um, this is another piece on that sandstone. Again, you can see all the hematite and everything. And this is that little pocket and all the crystals here are, you know, all have oxides all over it. So you have, they're all covered in red. And uh, we try to get this pocket out, which was difficult, because you can see there's not much around it to uh, actually chisel into. Um, but a really nice little pocket here, you can see some clay in it, and all the quartz crystals have that red coating on it from the hematite. Uh, this is a kind of before after, I guess. This is actually an area that we were digging, again, looking in the soil. And to the right here are two crystals that I found. That's actually the in situ, and that's the dirty photo, and the one that you saw a little bit earlier, that one that was had that uh, hematite stain in it, is actually that crystal to the left there. And a lot of the crystals here, unfortunately, have damage. I mean, that's just, again, it's one of those things, uh, but they're pretty. And if you're able to do something with it, um, then hey, I say go for it. I actually just forgot, um, Steve Alther of the Richmond Club um, had actually faceted specimens of the quartz from chestnut into very beautiful faceted stones. So if you have the ability to do that, and that's something that you're interested in, they actually are really nice facet grade quartz up here. And again, I mean, it's quartz, right? So it's not that valuable faceted, but with some of the hematite inclusions and stuff, it would be very pretty um, and definitely a recommendation for those pieces that don't have tips, but are still glassy clear. Um, here's two other photos kind of showing you the matrix. And again, I'm, I, and I keep highlighting this. I mean, you can see on the both the left and the right, we have two beautiful crystals that are kind of sticking out amongst the others. And that's what you're going to get here. You're not going to get this plate that has no damage points. You're going to find maybe one or two that has withstood the test of time. And that's going to be your main point on that piece. Um, we have found pieces that are, you know, fairly undamaged, but rare. Um, you can also see on the left here, uh, 
there's a lot of hematite coating. So a really nice piece there with all the hematite that kind of coating over it. Here's some other pieces. Again, I, I really like the hematite that's included here because they almost make this kind of weird milkshake looking type of stuff. It's really interesting. There is some quartz that are real milky here, uh, but really, really nice pieces, double terminated. Um, and, and again, they're, they're kind of unique and different. And if you ever wanted to facet or do something, they would make kind of a cool piece or a cab or something like that. Um, over to the right is one of our little small plates that we found. It's probably about the size of a 50 cent piece um, in diameter, I guess. And um, it's a nice piece. It's not that much damage on it. It has some nice aesthetics to it. Uh, but again, not as common to find. Uh, this is an average day. So you, you may go up there, you're going to find tons of quartz pieces, but doesn't mean they're all going to be, you know, no damage. They could be half crystals or whatever, but you can just see the quality here of the clarity of the crystals and they're really nice. They're really cool. Um, and then over to the right is kind of the ones that you high grade out of it. And then here you can see we're high grading. I mean, you know, I call it our little Arkansas, you know, <laughs> you know, it's no Ray Coleman mind, you know, to, but it's cool. It's a cool spot. It's a fun place to go. And it has some really nice, pretty clear quartz crystals. So, I mean, with that, I mean, what else can you ask for? I mean, it's a really cool place and I love the location. And then here's that a really nice piece that shows you that coating, right? I mean, it's just covered in this tar black substance. And um, again, that's probably hematite or gertite in this case. And, um, you know, you can see here in the middle, this is kind of cool. There's actually a double terminated crystal. So it's broken off and it's kind of rehealed on top of another one. Um, but sometimes these actually made really nice pieces because one thing that Chestnut Ridge doesn't have is good contrast. The matrix is not fantastic that it has such a good contrast that when you put in oxalic acid, you're like, wow, I can see the crystals like really well. It's almost as if it's kind of all meshed together. So when you have pieces like this, you want to put it in an acid because it kind of shows you, you know, the nice clear points versus that very dark black uh, oxide coating. This is cool. This is kind of, again, a big area here. This is where a space had kind of opened up. We got one half of it off, but then here you're, you're presented with this whole wall of quartz crystals. And I'll have to check with my friend if I'm not mistaken, because I know we found it in 2016, but this one quartz crystal here in the middle is the first image I'm pretty sure that I showed you. That's a nice large quartz crystal. You can see that the other ones are damaged or broken or have cracked. But we were able to get one out, which is chiseling back behind that, and get that nice piece out. So um, that's what you have to do here. You just have to get into some of these things. It's hard as hell, again, to dig into. Um, so take some time, take a break, go do some sifting, go try to find some matrix pieces, and, and then you'll have a good time. Um, this is showing, uh, again, trying to dig out some of the tree roots. Of course, we put the dirt back in, you know, to make sure... We're not, you know, damaging the trees by any means. But again, that's also why we use plastic shovels. So we're not actually doing much damage to the tree. Uh, but um, right here where my shovel is, my little small plastic shovel, there's kind of a little area where I've been digging. You can see I've been digging down into. And I was digging in there one day, and this was kind of early on when we went to Chestnut. And I found this specimen, and it was the largest quartz crystal that I've ever found there. And you can see it over here to the right, it's about three inches long. And it was a fantastic piece. It was unfortunately not sticking up, but kind of laid back into the matrix on top of the other quartz crystals, um, but a very beautiful piece. And if someone would have just dug six more inches in, they would have found it. And that comes back to our, you know, as all rock hounds we know, should we give up or should we dig? And maybe we'll find that vein within six more inches. That's a decision you make. And then someone comes to your spot, and they, they've discovered the mother load. So, um, but this was one of the best specimens uh, in, in length that I've ever found. And then here it is cleaned up uh, without oxalic acid. And then here it is with oxalic acid. I apologize for the quality of the images. Um, they're not my, you know, typical ones, but these were from some of the older collections that are collecting days that I did years ago. But again, you can see that when you have them without, they have all the orange iron staining in it. 
and then you clean them and it looks like something you'd see from Arkansas. And then this is a very uh, recent picture. I'm not going to tell you where it's at up on the mountain because it's from someone who sent it to me, but you can't always get in to these rocks. They're huge, giant boulders. And so someone found a boulder on the mountain and there was actually a pocket that he was able to stick his, he was able to dig, dig, dig underneath because it was in the dirt, stick his phone up in, inside of it and take a picture with a flash and look up in it. There's no way you're ever going to get this. There's no way you're ever going to be able to dig this out. It's solid, massive, giant piece of car, size of a car. But this is kind of a natural habitat, I'd say, of these quartz crystals. This is what you're looking at. Um, this is a really unique piece because we normally see Chestnut Ridge from the lens of matrix pieces and the lens of single crystals, but this is what it looks like. I mean, if you're trying to get a pocket view, this is your pocket view. This is a beautiful photo showing that from the location. All right, so there's a big mystery <laughs> from Chestnut Ridge and it's the Spalarite mystery. And it was stated by correspondence, I, I'll say that um, some people had found, in this case, Francis Villamain, had discovered a quartz crystal that had a Spalarite crystal included within it or ruby zinc variety for this case. Um, and you know, it's one of those things that the, just the mineralogy does not make much sense. Um, what is it? Well, according to Francis Villamain, that personal communications, and this has actually continued to be published and cited by Dietrich, cited by Alan Pinnock, cited by the DMME and they're not in their 2007 minerals, uh, Virginia, um, collecting guide, or they had a little PDF that it was sphalerite. But when you go back and you look, it actually was just a microscopic method at the Smithsonian Institute. So it is a Smithsonian. So I'm not going to say that they're wrong by any means, but it was just a very rare and interesting thing. I, there's no way that you could really test that to be sphalerite without actually damaging the crystal. Um, I also thought at one time there was only one found, and it was actually on the collection of David Limscomb at the VA Rock Shop. Then I found out there was a second crystal that supposedly had sphalerite in it. And then on the DMME article, they have a photograph of one that's sphalerite, but it's not this ruby color. But again, there's just a lot of inconsistencies here. And once we get to the question and answers, I like to kind of talk with everyone about it, about what do you think about this? Because it's one of those things where it's one of these little personal communications. It was identified by the Smithsonian, but again, how do we know? Where is those test results? I don't know if there is anything done besides, you know, this preliminary microscopic look at it. Could it be a negative crystal within it and then it was filled in with hematite? Because again, we know that the hematite here in some of the coarse crystals is as red as what you see right now. Um, but again, it's just a, one of those things that come with every location in Virginia that makes it unique. And that's just a ridge, this weird sphalerite mystery. There's nothing in that area that has any, you know, represented for the zinc or the sulfite or anything like that. So it's just a very interesting piece. And then here is a photograph from the DMME in their article. Again, you can't really tell, is it red, is it not red? You can see that these are two different crystals, um, but this has been documented as sphalerite. So a very interesting kind of little anecdote that we can talk about. And then before I end, because again, I didn't want to take too long on this, um, I have a really cool thing that I would like to share with you all tonight. This is an article from 1993, so the photo that you saw earlier, by Jane Owen, who's here with us tonight, uh, and it's a prose about Chestnut Ridge. Uh, this was actually published, I think it was volume 33, uh, number three in 1993. Um, it was, it was a poem or a prose written by Jane. And then the graphics that you see over here to the right was done by Betsy Martin, who's been very influential in her work for Moorfield Mine and has been a really great historian for the Richmond Gym and Mineral Society. Uh, Betsy used to always draw these things. I mean, we talk about newsletters these days. I mean, it didn't get much better than 
the hard work and the artistic work that went into these old newsletters. You can see everything from the elevation over here to the people that were on the trip, you know, the car down at the bottom and all the way up to the top panting. And so I want to read this to you before we end, because I think it's something that really is why I do what I do. I mean, this is the best of the best. This is better than minerals. This is the history of our community and is what, you know, is very important and why we do this and why I do what I'm doing for my project. So here it goes, the incredible Bath County Quartz field trip. And again, everything that you hear in this is exactly how this area is. It was six in the morning when we left town. We went up through Stanton, wound all around. As we followed our map, the road got more narrow, but at least we didn't end up in a furrow. I really don't mind a three hour trip for a good place to dig, it's only a skip. From a dirt road, we drove up into Buster's yard. He was happy to see us and he's quite a card. With my camera, I planned to make our journey log. When he saw it, Buster said, I'll go get my dog. We photographed them and up the mountain we went. I wasn't prepared for that vertical ascent. Beneath the leaves, rocks and roots made it tough, rough, as if those slippery leaves weren't enough. It took 20 minutes about for the climb, so we had to take everything with us this time. A shovel, a hammer, a bucket, a claw, and water and lunch were all that I saw. Rudy dropped to his knees and started to dig. One rock that he found was really big. It seemed to be twice the size of a football and all those beautiful quartz points covered it all. But it was too heavy to carry back down, so he had to leave it there on the ground. We scratched in the leaves, we dug in the dirt. Our lighter weight finds would not make us hurt. We found loose quartz crystals and some on a crust. To carry them back down the hill was a must. Later on, Barbara said, come up here. So I climbed bigger rocks and carried less gear. There on the plateau, I parted the leaves and there lay more quartz crystals ready to seize. So the next time I go, I'm taking a rake, but not in the summer, I don't want a snake. To make our selections, we tried very hard, but constantly we had to keep up our guard. We knew we would tax ourselves carrying too much because we still had those hammers, shovels, and such. The small points were pretty, but the large ones were too. So we wrapped up the best, it was all we could do. Barbara had said she fell, once, she fell on her back, trying to carry them, all in a sack. Gravity helped as we made our descent, and as soon as I found out just what Barbara meant. More leaves to contend with and acorns and such. It was a time to be careful and not lose your touch. Down the hill I felt like a real Northwest Mountie, and I knew I would have to return to Bath County. <laughs>